my basic theory. Now what I want to do is just go to the American case very quickly, give you a brief history of U.S. foreign policy. And again, what I'm going to try and do here is convince you that the United States has behaved according to my theory over time. And number two, then go to China and explain to you why I think China will act much the way the United States has. Okay, the United States has pursued regional hegemony from the start. We got our independence from Britain in 1783. We declared independence in 1776, and we got it in 1783. When the United States got its independence, it was comprised of 13 colonies strung out along the eastern seaboard, or the Atlantic seaboard of what is now the United States. What happened from 1783 up until the 1850s is that the United States marched across North America, murdered large numbers of Native Americans, stole their land, went to war with Mexico and stole from Mexico what is now the southwest of the United States. This was called Manifest Destiny. It was all about making a great power in North America. We invaded Canada in 1812. Our principal goal was to make Canada part of the United States. For those of you who've been to Canada, you know Ottawa is the capital of Canada, not Toronto. The reason Toronto is not the capital of Canada is that the British, who ran Canada at the time, expected the Americans to pay a return visit to try and capture Canada once again. And they wanted a capital that was far away from the border with the United States. Caribbean, places like Cuba and Haiti, would all be part of the United States today were it not for the slavery issue. The northern states did not want any more slave-holding states in the Union, and because sugar was the principal crop in the Caribbean, and sugar is a labor-intensive industry, and there were lots of slaves in the Caribbean, it was impossible to go south. Otherwise, the United States would have gone south. We, the United States, had a voracious appetite for conquest and incorporating land through things like the Louisiana Purchase, the Purchase of Alaska from France and Russia, respectively. Furthermore, the United States was very interested in making sure there were no great powers in the Western Hemisphere. You understand this is what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. In 1823, President James Monroe told the European great powers, we all in the Western Hemisphere, you're not welcome here. We're not powerful enough to throw you out, but we are eventually going to reach the point where we're powerful enough to throw you out, and we're going to throw you out, and you're not welcome back. And when I was a young boy, they had the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1963. The United States went ballistic at the idea that the Soviets would put missiles in Cuba. They were violating the Monroe Doctrine. And then later, the Soviets talked about building a naval base at Cienfuegos. This was categorically unacceptable to the United States. The United States does not want any distant great powers forming a military alliance with a country in the Western Hemisphere. And as I'm sure many of you know, one of the principal reasons the United States entered World War I in April 1917 against Germany was because of the infamous Zimmermann telegram, where the German government told Mexico that if it joined the war against the United States on Germany's side, should the Americans enter the war, the Germans would help Mexico recover lands lost in the southwest of the United States. This is just unacceptable to the United States, right? So what I'm telling you here is with Manifest Destiny and with the Monroe Doctrine, the United States went to great lengths to purposely achieve regional hegemony. And by the late 1890s, it had accomplished that task. But furthermore, as you know, the United States has another goal, and that other goal is to make sure that there are no peer competitors. Well, in the 20th century, 
there were four potential peer competitors. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. The United States played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. The United States entered World War I and played a key role in defeating Imperial Germany. It beat Japan in World War II single-handedly, and it played a key role, not the decisive role, in defeating Nazi Germany. The Soviet Union, of course, played the decisive role in defeating Nazi Germany, but we participated in the enterprise in a serious way, for sure. And then finally, during the Cold War, the United States played the key role in containing the Soviet Union and then ushering it down the toilet bowl. The United States does not tolerate peer competitors. This is consistent with my theory. Okay. So what I've tried to do in the first two parts of this talk is I've tried to make it clear to you what my theory of great power politics is. And I've tried to make it clear that the United States has behaved according to the dictates of that theory. So let's talk now about how China will act in Asia, assuming China continues to grow. I, there's no question that the Chinese are going to try and dominate Asia. They'd be fools not to. If I were the national security advisor in Beijing, I'd be deeply interested in making sure that China dominated Asia. You want to be the most powerful state in the region by far. If you're Chinese, somebody says to you, you have two choices. You can have a world where Japan is 10 times more powerful than you, China, or you're 10 times more powerful than Japan. Which one do you take? Many Americans would say, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. Realism is dead. All this balance of power politics doesn't matter. You think the, Jap you think the Chinese think that way? I don't think so. Chinese talk about the century of natural, national humiliation, running from the 1840s to the 1940s. Century of national humiliation. Chinese were weak. They know what happens when you're weak. You do not want to be weak in international politics. Anybody who's dealt with the United States today knows you don't want to be weak in the face of the United States. You want to make sure you're really powerful. The Chinese fully understand that. They have a deep-seated interest in making sure they're much more powerful than Japan, much more powerful than Russia, much more powerful than India. Any of those countries that look like they could give the Chinese a run for their money. They'll do everything they can to maximize their power. Furthermore, let's talk about a Chinese version of the Monroe Doctrine. You think the Chinese are happy about having the American military right on their border? You think they're happy about having the American military in the Western Pacific, having the American military in South Korea, having the American military in Japan? I told you about the Monroe Doctrine. We Americans are not happy about any distant great power coming into our neighborhood. It drives us crazy. But you think the Chinese are different? They shouldn't care. You think they think the United States is a benevolent great power? That's not the way they think. That's why they'll tell you behind closed doors, when they get powerful enough, they intend to push us out beyond the first island chain and then out beyond the second island chain. And I don't blame them one bit. If I were Chinese, I'd want to do that myself. I'd want to make sure that I dominated Asia, especially East Asia, 